On this week's episode of the Nerd Federation Podcast, I'll be dissecting the huge weekend we just had in pro wrestling as former WWE superstars become champions in new promotions. On the video game side of things, the Halo TV show jumps the shark in episode 4 and finally has me fed up with the series. And then some somber news, PlayStation is laying off 900 employees as the video game industry continues to buckle under economic pressure. Episode 15 starts right now. Doing a little bit something different for episode 15 of the Nerd Federation podcast. And you're probably wondering, well, what the hell are you doing 15 episodes in? But these are the things that you have to do that you need to do to attract an audience. So I told you guys last week that things are going to change here and there. Going to experiment. Going to get a little crazy. But... Yeah, that's just kind of the way things go as we are here on a Tuesday night, February 27th. The month is almost over, which is fucking crazy. We are now just a few days away from AEW's revolution. And that is looking like a stacked card. And when I was getting ready for the show today... I honestly wasn't even thinking about even doing any kind of preview for Revolution because I've already talked about some of the stuff, some of that stuff last week, a couple of weeks ago. So believe it or not, there's actually not going to be a lot of AEW talk this week because we just came off of a massive weekend of pro wrestling, as I mentioned And there are a lot of things there that I want to talk about today. I'm just maybe maybe a few hours removed from watching that, I want to call him Dolph Ziggler, that Nick Namath, David Finley match. And as I was watching that match, there were a lot of things that were going through my mind because I already knew what the results were. I already knew that Namath had won the title, had beat Finley, but... As I'm walking on the treadmill watching that match, I had a few different things go through my head. And I'm going to get to that in a couple of minutes because before I go on discussing this week's topic and, you know, I do these little preambles sometimes and these intros and kind of maybe get a little bit personal and share some things that I am talking about or thinking about, I should say. And I wanted to share a quick story about engagement on social media and how it doesn't necessarily translate into success the way you might want it to. And one thing I'll often hear on, you know, you when you're becoming a content creator, You'll hear about this, you'll read about it, and you'll find these different tips and tricks. And one of them is always selling yourself on social media, as I am taking out a piece of paper and pen because, of course, my dumbass has forgotten about (laughs) timestamps again this week to keep track of that. But so promoting yourself on social media, it's table stakes, as they say, the tried and true cliche thing that people say. And As someone that has a full-time job and a life outside of this podcasting thing, that whole social promotion has been a struggle for me from the very beginning. I know it's a necessity. It really is. But I only have so many hours in a day and my day job comes first. I actually had somebody, a friend of mine, text me the other day and I haven't My apologies for not getting back to you if you're listening to this, but he was asking me how the podcast is going. And what I wanted to respond back to him was, hey, it's going. Um, Episode 15 now, even though this 
track on my garage band says episode 14 but i'm episode 15 i'm i'm trudging along and i think a lot of it for me was to make sure that i was disciplined enough to do with this every week i mean 15 you're talking about like 15, 16 weeks in a row of doing of doing this and obviously things have changed over that time but anyway the social media thing has been a struggle and I try to be strategic on when I post. So I post as much as I can on the weekends, during wrestling shows, etc. I'm mostly posting on threads and I need to be better on posting on Twitter. But I mean, who knows if they're, it, it seems that usage over there, it, it's funny the way different content creators look at these different avenues, these different uh, platforms. So I don't know, but it seems as though threads and X slash Twitter are really the way to go. And there was one situation over the weekend that I thought, hey, let me respond to this question on my podcast account and see what happens. So I think it was Saturday night, the Video Game Award account had asked a question um, on their Twitter account. And the question was simple. What's the best video game related podcast that you listen to? Now, I wasn't going to be a smart ass and be like, oh, the Nerd Federation podcast. Why? Who? I mean, what else? No, I wasn't going to do that. But for me, it was easy because I've, and I mentioned this before on the show, how I listened to the last, the last damn media of a podcast. And that includes Sacred Symbols, which is a PlayStation podcast, and that's at the head of the table, pun intended. I've listened to all 295 episodes of that show. I'm actually going to one of their live shows next month because it's down in New York City and I'm in the Hudson Valley, so it's a quick train ride down. I'm actually spending the night at a hotel overnight because I was not taking Metro North back (laughs) to where I live at that time of night and I went to one of their live shows last year in Virginia in Richmond Virginia and that was fun and I listened to as much of their content as possible they do an Xbox show the Finding Duke they do a Nintendo show punching up they do a conversational show constellations that has a variety of topics and not just video games so with that context My answer to that question on Twitter was simple. I said, at Last Day Media, I made sure to tag them, end of story. That was it. As they say, that was the tweet. So, a funny thing happened as time had gone on with that tweet as far as the engagement on the tweet was concerned. And I'm I'm pulling up the I'm pulling up the final the final stats here on it. So that was viewed 12,892 times. That's how many impressions, meaning people saw the tweet. So uh, likes, 445 likes. Profile visits. Here's the thing that gets me. 203 profile visits. So about half the people that liked, a little less than half I should say, that liked the tweet went out so far as to look at my profile. So amongst the people that liked the tweet, Dustin Furman, who was the executive producer of Last Damn Media. He's also the co-host of Sacred Symbols and the main host of the Nintendo podcast. He liked it. Another gentleman, Lockmore, he's one of the editors over there, and he's in the family of the Last Damn Media podcast. Excuse me. So I'm thinking, okay, how does that translate into downloads of my podcast? And you know what it translated into? Absolutely zero. Zero, zero, zero. Now, 
I didn't respond the way I did solely for the engagement. I genuinely do love the Last Day in Media family of podcasts. And I think that the head of the table over there, Colin Moriarty, has created uh, what he's created over there to be commended. And he gets an incredibly bad rap from the video game industry for a variety of reasons, whether it's the media that covers the industry, the people within the industry, and the gamers themselves. And I'm here to tell you how wrong everybody is about him because I listen to him every week. So I know <laughs> that they're wrong. Anyway, I just thought it was interesting that I didn't get the rub from that reply that I thought I was going to get. And who knows, maybe people subscribe to the show on various podcast platforms and I'll see a bump this week. But I have to admit, I was a little bummed that there wasn't an immediate result. And it's funny because my girlfriend says that I get very frustrated when I can't figure out something quickly or see a result on something very quickly. And it's true. I have my patience is very, very thin. And, you know, I'm, I'm 15 episodes into this now, as I mentioned, really 16 if you count episode zero. And I'm having honest conversations with myself about what more can I do to get a little bit more engagement? But I, listen, I, I knew this coming in. The market is saturated. I mean, that's just kind of the bottom line. And you have to find ways to stand out. And listen, maybe what I'm doing is not connecting with people. TBD on whether things I say really strike a nerve. I do know that I like sitting in front of this microphone every week and getting my thoughts out there. And hopefully I can get more people to come along for the ride at some point. And Today, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name names for this particular thing, but I was listening to a podcast today because I wanted to see how he did the show because he's also a solo podcaster like myself. And he talks about he does talk about video games. And I will preface this by saying that this man has a lot of experience in the industry talking and writing about video games from a media perspective. Long history. I'll leave it at that. He does a podcast by himself. That's all I'm going to say. Listening today because I want to see how he goes about doing it. And he he actually does live stream the show while he's doing it so he can get participation from his listeners, which is smart. And he does you know make some comments on what he sees in the chat which is a good way to do interaction during these shows and you're not just getting his perspective, but mostly it is his perspective. I have to admit, I was not impressed. And and I'm not saying that as trying to be somebody that I'm better than because I'm looking at this from a entertainment perspective and I understand that this guy has a lot of industry knowledge for what he's done over the years, but I, I have to admit it was it was underwhelming. I thought he was kind of talking down at the industry in some ways, and maybe people who have been around the industry that long get a little jaded, which I can understand. But I also wonder, well, why are you doing a show? Because it doesn't sound like you're having a good time doing the show. And as I mentioned just previously right now, you sound like you're belittling the industry and um, insulting certain aspects of it. I, I found it very I found it very strange. I also found it strange that when he was kind of going through the stuff that he's played lately, it's just, I don't know, he just didn't seem excited about what he was playing or even what he was saying. And it was a turnoff. It it really was a turnoff, and I thought to myself as I'm going through this podcast, I'm thinking to myself, what what is really this is this guy is a popular show, and and the reason why I started listening to him is because I saw that somebody responded to that question, and then I see he's a solo podcaster. I'm like, oh shit, let me give this guy a listen and see what happens. Look, I'm gonna give it another episode or two. I'm almost through this first episode that I listened to. 
Maybe he was having an off week, but I'm willing to give it a chance. But it just kind of got me questioning myself in some ways and thinking, man, I feel like I'm doing a better job than he is, but yet he's been doing this for much longer than me. But what are you going to do as I take a deep breath and kind of transition into the next part of this show? And, you know, I'm going to get into the pro wrestling stuff now, and I'm not going to do a transition here. I will take a little break in a bit, but I'm trying to record as much of this podcast as I can in one shot. And, man, what a what a weekend we just had. In, in pro wrestling starting really it started with it started with dynamite on Wednesday and I thought that was a weaker show this week I'm not gonna I'm not gonna front but if you look at Wednesday Thursday Friday and Saturday between New Japan starting Thursday TNA's pay-per-view no surrender on Friday and then you had elimination chamber on Saturday And you had Collision on Saturday night. And we really did have three straight days of bangers. At least I I do. I think that. And at this point, I've watched the majority of it by now. The one thing I did not watch, Rampage. And I have yet to watch the Naito championship match against Sonata. Even though I know Naito won. No shit. That was going to happen. He's going to face... uh, Show is it Show or Yo that has the title, the uh, heavy the junior heavyweight championship? I think it's Show. They're going to be wrestling on the anniversary show, as tradition dictates. Almost every year that they've done that, the heavyweight champion wrestles the junior heavyweight champion in the main event of that show that happens next Wednesday, and I'll obviously be watching that uh, when the time comes, but. Going back, looking at the weekend that was, and the biggest takeaway for me is the power of having WWE on your resume, especially, especially if you're wrestling in New Japan. Look, I'm not an idiot. (laughs) As much as I've soured on WWE over the years, They are still the top dog, for better or worse. I've said that on this podcast time and time again. And while it's no longer number one in my book, after being the case for so many years, I'm not dumb. Having WWE on your resume is attractive in the pro wrestling world. If you've been on WWE TV, in most cases... You're going to be able to charge a premium when you're out on the independent scene. And you're going to be able to charge a premium for your per appearance fee for these major promotions that are out there. And then the reason why that helps is because you know as a wrestler, if you're going to a new organization, whether it's TNA, whether it's AEW, whether it's New Japan, People know immediately what's up. Doesn't matter what you did in the Fed, okay? There's a credibility aspect to having WWE on your resume. So, what we had happened this past weekend is that three former WWE wrestlers captured championships over the weekend. Two in New Japan and one in TNA. On Thursday, you had Matt Riddle capture the New Japan television title when he beat Tanahashi, which is a nice feather in his cap. And then in the main event of the same show, you had Nick Namath capture the IWGP Global Championship over David Finley. The next night, on Friday night, Mustafa just the way you're supposed to pronounce it, Ali main evented the No Surrender TNA pay-per-view and won the X Division title in what was really a great match with Chris Saban. 
you should go out of your way and go watch that match because it's it's a tie for my top match of the weekend between that and the IWGP Global Championship match. Those are it's it's mm, mm, gun to my head. Gun to my head. I'm gonna say the best the better match was the X Division title match. And I only reason I say that is because sometimes, and I've mentioned this before, New Japan matches are very formulaic. There's a formula to them. And I was very curious to see how Nick was going to do in that environment. Anyway, let's let's pause there and talk about the main event for the X Division title Friday night because those two guys put on a clinic in the main event. Listen, you already know what Chris Saban can do, right? If you follow the Motor City Machine Guns of him and Alex Shelley, you know what those guys can do. I've ranted and raved, I raved on, I think on episode zero, about going to the Chicago Fieldhouse in the suburbs of Chicago and seeing Motor City Machine Guns and the Briscoe Brothers tear down the fucking house on a goddamn house show. On what amounted to a fucking house show. It was unbelievable. Anyway, I think the thing that was even more impressive about that main event on Friday was that those two had never wrestled before. I'm telling you, if you have a chance to go watch the match, do it. No Surrender only costs $10. It's the best $10 you're ever going to spend because overall... It was a really good it really it was a really good show. The main event was great. Both guys were silky smooth in the ring. Ali was over as fuck with the crowd, which was I I, I think a little surprising because let's be honest, he never really found his footing with WWE and him being involved in the cruiserweight uh division and being involved with that fucking awful retribution group and storyline, which fell incredibly flat for various reasons. And that wasn't his fault per se. And I think he probably did the best that he could do under the circumstances, but I'm sure that's a situation that leaves scars. And since he's been let go from WWE He's been very smart about the way he's presented himself. And it's just, it just so happens that he gets released and it happens to coincide with the basically a presidential election year. And he's taking advantage of it. He's leaning into it and it's paying dividends for him. And I'm going to be curious to see what happens from here on out with him because is he going to be that assassin for hire? You know, he helps bring the TNA X Division a little bit more shine and the company a little bit more shine. And does he do that for half a year? And maybe the second half of the year, he's doing some stuff for New Japan or he finds himself, he finds himself in AEW. Um, we don't, we don't really know. I don't, I don't know what the situation is with that. But um, it's interesting to just kind of see how things have played out for him. And I've got a soft spot for the guy because I watched him wrestle for AAW out of Chicago. Uh, I mentioned this before on the show that AAW is this super independent out of Chicago. And I went to quite a few of their shows when I was living out there. And I saw Ali wrestle for AAW right before he started with WWE in 2016 so it's really good to find him to see him finding success on his own and really finding the right the right path for him and as far as Riddle and Namath are concerned I don't really have a lot to say about Riddle because he's been on the indies before we know that he's been out there before I actually saw Riddle and Michael Elgin wrestled a hell of a match at AEW, AAW years ago. May, it might have been the same year. It was either that 2016 or 2017 um, when I saw 
when I saw the him in that in that, in that match. Man, talk about somebody who has disappeared off the face of the earth and Mike Elgin. Jesus Christ. Anyway, so Riddle knows knows how that life works. He looked good in this match against the limited Ta- Tanahashi, and it's kind of crazy that he flies all that way for essentially what was 10 minutes of work. You know, you fly halfway around the world for 10 minutes of work, and I'm sure he's used to that by now. As for Mr. Nemeth, that was the last major match that I watched of the weekend and obviously just watched that before I hopped on to here. And I was really curious to see how he wrestle in that environment. And the announcers did a really good job of selling that. They they told that story. Namath has been uh, working in his cardio. He wants to make sure that he can go 20, 30, 40, 60 minute matches and man when they got to that 15 minute mark in, in this match you I mean he was you can tell he was a little winded I mean I'm, you got that adrenaline flowing and you're trying to prove something to yourself not only to yourself but to the people watching at home and man you could not have asked for a better introduction to this man in new japan because boy oh boy these two listen (laughs) sometimes when you're watching wrestling there are there are some times when you have to ask yourself these guys are really looking like they're laying into each other and that was the feeling that i got watching this match which is why I implore people to go watch it because that match was so hard-hitting that you really thought that these guys were beating the shit out of each other. And I know New Japan is, you know, strong style. It's, it's, it's you know, the king of... He got Nakamura calling himself the king of strong style, which is kind of a joke now. But anyway, but you know New Japan is known for that hard-hitting style and it's not even necessarily the chop show type of thing, but just really laying in the punches and the clotheslines and, and everything else. And man, oh man, these two fucking looked like they were killing each other. So much so that I, I love the way they did this because they had Namath came into the ring and he's waiting for Finley to come down. So Finley's music hits. Gato comes out because, you know, he's managing, quote-unquote, managing Finley. Gato comes out. He waves behind him for Finley to come out. But, of course, Finley is sneaking up behind Namath and attacks him. Listen, it's simple wrestling 101, but the reason why it worked here is because basically Finley was saying... Listen, motherfucker, (laughs) welcome to fucking New Japan Pro Wrestling. This is not WWE. You're not an Oz anymore, okay? So immediately, I think it was a minute or two before when that attack happened, Finley throws, I can't remember if it it, it happened. I think he threw him outside and throws him back into the ring. Under Nemeth's left eye, he's got a fucking mouse that's a pretty good size. And I'm like, oh, shit. So this... <laughs> Nemeth must be thinking, shit, this is how my career is going to start in New Japan. Where I'm basically wrestling this championship match out of one eye. But man, listen. Finley got his shit in. Finley was beating the shit out of Nemeth. He, he really was. It was the typical... It really was the typical heel... Under a uh, heel babyface match in that... Finley seemed to dominate for a good portion of it, portion of it, and Nemeth was fighting from underneath. And I think the reason why you do that with him in this situation is because you're getting start, you're trying to get the crowd behind him. So what better way than to get him from fighting underneath against the leader of the Bullet Club? I mean, that's what it comes down to. You're gonna get sympathy in that way. Gato comes and throws the shillelagh. I, I think that's funny that that um, that Finley's using his father, using Finley's uh, shillelagh, and they mentioned that it's his, his father's shillelagh. You know, 
distracts the ref- Gato distracts the referee, throws a shillelagh into into the ring, and Finley whacks Nemeth in the knee with that end. And you know how that goes. We've seen that a million times, but again, it works so well here because it's just it's that good versus evil type of thing that they have going on. And Nemeth held his own. He, I think the match was almost 30 minutes. I think it was like 25 minutes or so, which is shit. When was the last time has Nick Namath ever wrestled a match for 25 minutes? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how long he's gone before that match on, on Thursday. But yeah, he did a really good job. He cut off, a, you know, it was a decent promo at the end. You really can't, the gaijins as they call them, really can't get too deep in the promos in the ring because the Japanese audience, they understand English, but I don't know how in depth that they are. So it would name, it would do name it well to learn some Japanese, maybe in the same way that Kenny Omega did. But yeah, again, it was, it was, I, I'm, I'm was happy to see that. I'm happy to see him already doing so well and making a name for himself in in New Japan, and I'll be curious to see how things play out. Is he going to be the champion by the time they do Forbidden Door in June? Oof, it it, oh, it kind of seems that way. I mean, it would be a great way to get him involved in AEW, without a doubt. That would be something now because he would be associated with three major pro wrestling promotions. I don't know. We'll see how... Uh, We'll see how things play out from this Mr. Nemeth going forward. But I want to change gears here and talk a little bit about Elimination Chamber because I did not wake up at whatever time, 5 a.m. in the morning, to watch Elimination Chamber. And I think I watched some of it on Saturday and then I finished it off on Sunday and... I got to say, it was overall, it was a really good show. I thought they did a good job with it. Obviously, that crowd there in Perth was rabid for WWE. They hadn't had a show there in a very long time. I forget exactly how long it had been. But I thought the show, I'm sorry, I'm like playing with a piece of paper here. I thought the show was better than Royal Rumble. And I've already said before, I am not a fan of having the same type of match on the same show. Two Survivor Series matches, two Royal Rumble matches, two Elimination Chamber matches. You've listen, and AEW's been guilty of this as well. Two uh, two trios matches. I'm sorry, a three way dance matches, and you know, too many tag team matches. I just not a fan. I'm just not a fan of that. Not a, no disqualification and a street fight. AEW's been guilty of that. WWE's guilty of that on it on it on its shows. I mean, that's just I'm I'm just not a fan of that at all. But I think in this instance, it was entertaining and. I definitely think that the men's chamber match was better than the women's match. And the women's match wasn't bad. Don't get me wrong. I just enjoyed the men's match more. Going back to the women's match, obviously Becky Lynch wins. She's going to go on now to WrestleMania and challenge... I think she's challenging... Who is she challenging? I think she's challenging... Um, Ripley, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just check that. Because I just want to make sure I have it right. This is this is the problem when you have... Fucking two different champions. <laughs> oh my god. Who is she? Let's see. Yeah. It's Rio Ripley versus Becky Lynch and then EO Sky versus Bailey. And where where the fuck is Bailey, by the way? Where the fuck is Bailey on these WrestleMania posters? Can we let like can we talk about that for a second? Like, what the fuck is going on? 
You got Bianca Belair, who, by the way, I mean, Bianca Belair is great. I've always, I've always been a big fan of hers, but hello, Bailey won the Women's Royal Rumble. Why is she not on these posters? I don't understand why she's not on these posters. Anyway, Tiffany Stratton, Jesus Christ. I had seen a couple of her matches in NXT, not super familiar with her. She's got a gymnast background, and she was really, really impressive in that match. I mean, I I, I got to give it to her. And that, it's good when you get that, damn, she's 24 years old. That former gymnast background really does work. Look at Lady Frost. She just wrestled Serena Deeb on Collision on Saturday night. That gymnast background can really help you I think, do some things a little bit differently than what others might do. That, the the backhand, uh, the backflip, uh, oh God, elbow, oh God, I know what the name of it is and I can't fucking remember, oh God, somebody's probably screaming at me right now, um, you know what I'm talking about, doing the, the backwards flip into the elbow, into the corner, I mean, she did... It was it was flawless. It was it was almost flawless. So, yeah, she's. I mean, she's she's only twenty four. You know, she's only twenty four. So she's got. I mean, really, the sky is kind of the limit on uh, on her. So, um, yeah, it's um, it's crazy that how how well she uh, she's been doing. Uh, and the popularity that's really, it's, it's developing for her. And I think she did herself some favors in that match. Men's match, I thought it was also good. I mean, listen, we fucking knew Drew McIntyre was going to win. I mean, let, that's not a fucking surprise. And I just think it's funny that all this shit, all this different shit that we had going on to try to build some interest and blah, 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 and make up for Punk being hurt and Rollins potentially being out. And I had said weeks ago, why, 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 are, we, why are we making this so complicated? Cody Rhodes is going to wrestle fucking Roman Reigns and Drew McIntyre is going to wrestle Seth Rollins for the belt. But we had to go on this fucking, you know, side mission to get to this point. And it was just really... Like, this whole thing has just been, like, a little bit convoluted. And I get it. Listen, I get it. Injuries happen. Punk getting hurt really fucked things up. But how about you not put your WrestleMania plans on somebody whose body is clearly breaking down? I said it. There, I said it. Um, And Drew McIntyre is saying it. So, but the interesting thing to come out of that, though, was... That Grayson Waller experience shit, which I fucking, I cannot stand. And supposedly that was supposed to be filler because that was supposed to be uh, the, the Seth Rollins match. And I'm thinking, why don't you fill a match with a match? Is that, am I, am I speaking out of term here? Like, why would we have a segment? But the interesting thing that comes out of that is the fact that Cody Rhodes essentially challenged The Rock to a match anytime, anywhere. So now you've got people asking, well, when's that going to happen? When when is that going to happen? I mean, the day... Listen, I didn't watch Raw at all. So I don't know if that storyline was advanced at all. Um, Let's see. It doesn't seem like that was the case. No. It's funny how they, they had a match. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, no. Um. There's no, you know, there's no kind of resolution to... Uh, Well, yeah, pa- Heyman comes out, dissuades Rhodes from his pursuit of the rock. Uh, Rhodes stands firm, armed with the chair as a defensive measure against Heyman's, the people who attacked him. I did see that. I did see that um, online, but 
Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. So the bottom line is like, when is that going to happen? Like, when are we going to see that match? Does it happen? There's no pay-per-views between now and then. Do we get a situation where if Roman and if Cody does win the title at WrestleMania, do you do the Rock and Cody Rhodes at SummerSlam? I mean, I could, I could see that happening, but do you do it night one at WrestleMania? I don't know. They're they're definitely giving themselves some options, uh, some options there. So we'll see how that plays out. My biggest takeaway from Elimination Chamber was Nia Jax. Man, her and Rhea Ripley really did a great job in that main event. And that was definitely the best I've seen Nia wrestle. She played that heel part to fucking perfection. It was the chef's kiss, man. She did a really, really great job as the heel in that match. Everything was smooth. Everything looked great. She sold well. She played the part well. Going after the fans and making fun of the family that was sitting in the front row. And she really did it. I mean, she really did a great job. And again, it was, listen, it was what we saw in the David Finley, um, the David Finley, uh, Nick Namath match, but kind of in reverse where Rhea Ripley as the champion was fighting from underneath the whole time. The hometown hero against the big baddie. The big batty asshole, pun intended there. If you know, you know. But yeah, I mean, again, d- d- great job by Nia. And I- I'll be curious to see. I know she gets a lot of shit. And I, and I understand that. P.O., she's unsafe. She sucks, blah, blah, blah. But listen, I don't care. You cannot take anything away from her for Saturday's performance. Because it, I thought it was... Listen, again, I haven't watched consistently, but man, did I see Nia wrestle a lot on NXT. Losing to opponents that were much smaller than her and in, I thought, were stupid ways. And then when she came up to the main roster, we saw, I mean, we we saw what happened. I was watching a lot back then when she came up and remember when she gave, obviously gave Becky the bloody nose and that kind of started the whole the man thing, the man storyline. So, listen... She's improved. Say what you want, but that that match Saturday night really was uh I think it elevated her in in ways. And this is why <laughs> you know, you can be elevated when you lose. It 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 all the crowd know. We're not stupid. Like the the crowd the, the smart marks know when somebody is improving and putting the time in, and I really, I can't say enough. I feel like I'm repeating myself about, about Nia Jax, but she did a great job there on Saturday morning against, well, Saturday night, Australia time, but she did a great job in that match. So, you know, and here we are now. We're, we're less than 40 days from, from WrestleMania 40, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm probably not going to really watch much of the week to week, to be honest with you. I mean, I've tried going down that path and I, I just can't do it. I have a really hard time doing it. So the social media stuff is enough. Listen, I've been watching this shit for so long that I can see clips and things and put together things. And, and I'm not, I don't feel, I feel like I'm not missing a beat. And I do think it's a fresh perspective I, in, in some ways because I'm not looking at the at the weekly. I'm not reviewing every single show. So, I don't get bogged down. I can take a step I can take a step out. I don't really review any of these shows, really, when you think about it. I'm not giving a play-by-play of going through this match and that match and every single show that I watch. I basically talk to you about the things that I liked from each show that I watched, the, the main main things, and then just kind of go from there. It makes it easier for me. And it makes me a lot less stressful. So, I said I wasn't going to talk about AEW too much. But I will say I I did watch Collision 
on Saturday night. And look, Daniel, uh, Daniel Bryan, <laughs> Brian Danielson, and I'm not even going to attempt to say the guy's name from DDT Pro Wrestling, did a phenomenal job Saturday. There is not even a question about that. We had Malachi Black have his first fucking singles match in almost two years. And I think that was in some ways why I I told you what I thought the best matches were. I think the most interesting match of the weekend might have been Malachi Black versus Brian Keith because it was so long since Malachi's last singles match and him having that match at a school that doesn't fucking count. My brother was being a smart ass and said that, oh, he just had a match at his... No, no, no. That does not count. That that does not count. And a lot has been made about his streak of nine singles matches. But, you know, that kind of came to a head last month when he responded to a fan that accused him of not wanting to do the job in any matches, let alone a singles match. And, of course, Malachi had to respond. I, I feel like he didn't have to, but he felt like he had to and said that the claim was bullshit. And, look, to be fair to the guy, he was hurt. So maybe he felt as though he couldn't properly go in a singles match. You, you hear that a lot. That happens. We've heard of wrestlers in the past saying that they felt as though they were healthy enough to do tag matches, or in this case, trios matches, but not healthy enough to do a singles match. But I'm really hoping that this is the beginning of a singles run for Malachi. Malachi and I can envision a scenario where Garcia wins the TNT title on Sunday at Revolution. And then you have Malachi chase Garcia for the title, considering there was some beef between Garcia and the House of Black near the end of the Continental Classic. And they say AEW doesn't tell stories. Anyway, that's going to do it for the pro wrestling portion of the podcast. I'm going to take a quick break. I desperately need to get some water and I'll be right back to chat about fucking Halo. Oh my God. Okay, be right back. And welcome back to episode 15 of the Nerd Federation podcast. I am your host. Will Hernandez, and a bit of breaking news, actually, in the break, if you can believe that, on a Tuesday night, Sean Spears is back in NXT, and apparently he is going by that name, which is kind of surprising. Didn't think I was going to have that in my bingo card for... 2024 so yeah apparently he showed up on nxt tonight and uh hit somebody in the back of the head with a chair so the chairman of nxt i don't know it looks like he's gonna go by sean spears and not by by ty dillinger and um yeah it's interesting you know it's interesting too and i'll kind of get back into a little bit of pro wrestling here for for a moment but you know, Tama Tonga from New Japan, he's done there. And uh, Meltzer, if he's to be believed, said that Tonga is signing with WWE, which I think is a good move for him because um, it might make sense for the Bloodline storyline, even though I feel like that's kind of run its course. Uh, by now but I I think one thing that I mentioned to my buddy who texted me about the uh, Sean Spears thing and my brother as well but one thing I was mentioning to him was how I think I think if I'm not mistaken read somewhere how 
WWE wants to get NXT back to what it was with the original Blue and Gold, where you had these major names, independent guys, New Japan guys, go to NXT first and work with the talent down there to kind of get them elevated. And, you know, then you're bringing back, you're bringing up to the main roster people who are seasoned in, in some ways. And God, they did that. I mean, how many times did they do that with in the black and gold? I mean, Adam Cole and the whole Undisputed Hour thing and Bobby Roode and Nakamura and Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens and FT well, the the arri- the the revival, the arrival, holy shit. The revival and Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks and Charlotte Flair and Bailey and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So maybe, you know, maybe we're getting back to that a little bit. And I think that would be a good thing to see for NXT and for and for WWE. So Okay, wow, there's a lot of pro wrestling happening. Uh, sometimes I wonder if I should just go exclusively pro wrestling. I, I do wonder that sometimes. But then, shit like episode four of the Halo TV series happens. And I'm like, nah. I'm going to mix in the video games as well. So, spoiler alert... I am going to spoil episode four of the Halo TV show. And I'm also going to spoil some of Halo, the video game. So you've been warned, okay? I will put in the timestamps that that I spoiled stuff. And, you know, when I get back to talking about regular stuff, when I get back to talking about the PlayStation stuff, I will... Note that, but you have been warned, I am going to spoil Halo TV show and the video game. Okay. Oh, I <laughs> I wish there was a camera on me. Um, and I don't, I, you know, I don't really believe in doing, and a lot of the stuff I'm going to speak from the hip, shoot from the hip. I try to do it as much as I can on the show, but I do have, I also do have typed out thoughts as well but i want to do this raw beak that that didn't sound good uh (laughs) i want to do this raw because listen i go back to episode zero and i've mentioned how halo is a video game that is near and dear to my heart and i mentioned last week when i was talking about masters of doom I missed out on that whole thing, that whole phase. I just didn't know people who played first-person shooters on PC. That wasn't really a thing that I grew up with. So when I became a young adult and had my first Xbox and I traded in that extra copy of Madden, the story goes I had Madden, I had NFL Fever, and I traded in Madden because I wanted to play NFL Fever because it was something new. It was a new franchise. Peyton Manning. Remember that? So I go to KB Toy Store. And we used to have those things. And I traded in Madden for Halo. And I had no idea what I was giving, getting myself into. And I'm reading the back of the box as what we used to do back in the day as I'm on the train. And I thought to myself, oh, this is interesting. Pop it in, boy, that, 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 there are definitely milestones in my gaming life and entertainment life, entertainment consumption life, and Halo Combat Evolved is definitely one of them. So I have a, and I'm, I'm, I get upset thinking about what Halo has become now because it really, it's not the same. You know, the first trilogy and even Halo Reach, which I'm going to get into, obviously, and Halo ODST, those were, think back at that, that was, those were all great games. And it's, it's funny watching the TV show was making me want to go back and play those games and really get deep into it for the podcast and talk about 
and talk about those games really again. And I think that might be that might be something I do over the summertime. I'm not I'm not too sure yet, but so for all here that's all the context you have. So when I watched season one of a TV show, I had to remind myself that this is a show that really did not have the hardcore gamer in mind. And I was okay with that because I understood that they were telling a different story. They were on a different timeline. And it was just kind of one of those things that you had to accept, maybe. Now, did I like Master Chief having sex? Absolutely fucking not. <laughs> that is something that, I mean, it's sacrilege in, in many ways. To have that character getting naked and having sex. What the fuck are we doing? Anyway, it was already it was already hard to kind of swallow my pride, I guess, in some ways, when we were talking about taking that helmet off of Master Chief, because the helmet makes that character. The fact that he didn't say a lot made that character. The fact that he's a killing machine is what makes that character. So when you take that stuff away in the first season of the show, people are going to have issues with it. But I was really trying to be open-minded. Listen, I spend an episode talking about that. Go back and listen to... I'm trying to find... uh, I'm trying to find the episode. Hold on. It is episode number 10. It wasn't that long ago. January 23rd. The title of the, of the episode is The Halo TV Show was actually dot 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 good. I was okay with what they were doing. And then we get to season four. And things are supposed to be different in season four because they, they fired the showrunners. They fired... The, some writers from season one and they were looking at season two to be like this soft reboot of the series and you know the first three episodes weren't bad but I kept on asking myself I don't know if I necessarily a like where this is headed And B, I am just confused as to what the fuck is going on here in some respects. You know what? I might spoil more than episode four now that I'm talking, now that I'm talking about it. So we knew that this season was going to be about the Fall of Reach. And for those who are not aware, the Fall of Reach is basically a prequel game to the Halo series. And it's not mo- it's not focused on Master Chief at all. It's focused on some of those Spartans that you see in um, season four of Halo, uh, season two of Halo, episode four. You know that 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 squad. Master Chief is not on Halo. I mean, he's not on Reach when the fall of Reach happens. It's it's not him. It's all these other. Uh, all these other soldiers and guess what they all die spoiler alert they all die you know who doesn't die (laughs) commander keys keys does not die on reach keys dies later on when he's infected by the flood and basically becomes a zombie but he does not die on reach like they had him die in episode four spoiler number one that really pissed me off because the way he dies in episode four i think is disrespectful to the character that is in the game and i was thinking 
listen, I'm going to I'm going to say it. They made Keys black in the Halo show. He's not black in the car in the cartoon, Jesus. He's not black in the video game, which is fine. I really don't give a shit, honestly. I don't I don't care. But here I was thinking, "Oh, don't you want this key character to get some more play in the TV show?" And you fucking kill him in just this stupid fucking scenario where he has to go outside the ship that's escaping reach with all these people from the planet. And he's got to like unplug the, the the fuel line. And he gets over, you know, he blows up the, the whatever after he blows up the fuel thing after he unhooks the ship. So he takes out a bunch of jackals. Uh, and, and elites with him. What? Like, what the fuck is happening? When that happened, I turned to my girlfriend. I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. Because <laughs> I, that just really, that really ticked me off. The other thing that ticked me off, which is probably the bigger issue that I'm having right now with this season, especially... With this particular episode. The Spartans armor. Is nowhere to be found. Because this guy. Ackerson. Who we really don't know much about. He's got a he's got a thing for the Spartans. Right? He hates the Spartans. Because his sister. Did not. Was taken. A, you know. Was taken to be a Spartan. And did not survive. The augmentation procedure. There's a thing that they do to make these people into basically Captain America. Think about it that way. Where they become these super, super soldiers. Even more deadlier than Captain America. So he's got this beef for the uh, for the Spartans. He knew that the Covenant were already on reach. But he was hiding it because the AI, Cortana was telling him there was zero chance for survival no matter how many times she ran the scenario, even if they fought back. And I mean, at least that falls in line with the game. It's called The Fall of Reach. I think the book is called Fall of Reach and then the game is called Reach. It's called Reach, The Fall of Reach for a reason. Because the planet gets glassed. But this guy fucking escapes... The planet, he he escapes Reach before the attacks happen and takes the Spartan armor with them. So they're fucking fighting in the streets without the armor. (laughs) Like, what are we doing? What the fuck are we doing? I could, I was beside myself as I was watching this. The crazy thing is, I go online after the show, and people who I would say are, I guess, more well-versed in video games than I will ever be, or people who are kind of like old-school gamers like myself, oh, that was a great episode, oh, I thought this was a great episode. I, I I couldn't believe it. And I and I said it on threads and I said it on, on Twitter. I, I, I said, I am in the minority here of liking this episode and liking where this season is going. I saw somebody, and this is how they get you with these YouTube thumbnails. I saw somebody, I'd never clicked on the video, but I and I didn't want to because I hadn't watched episodes two and three yet. We were behind watching, and the guy had said that the the thumbnail said it all about he didn't really know what the fuck was happening in this season, and I and I agree with that because you have McKee, who is now back for this season, who we thought died in season one, was shot in the fucking head by Kai in that last battle in season one. And then she shows up in season, in, in episode one of season two, 
in like a vision type of way and you're thinking oh well it's just a vision john john seeing things because of what happened in, in season one but no 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 there she is in season four and sees in episode four stealing the fucking uh the gimmick the gimmick thing that thing that gives them the, the, the artifact thing and there's no explanation as to why she's back so again here i'm thinking that episode that that she i'm getting my, conf- <laughs> i'm going back and forth between calling things episodes and seasons here i'm thinking that season two was going to be something different and i've been just disappointed with the way the whole thing is gone and i i told my girlfriend listen i know you're enjoying the show and she is so there you fucking go paramount you got the casual the person that doesn't play video games you got the casual to like your sci-fi shit show congratulations i told her i'm gonna stick through this and i'm gonna watch this car crash because i'm already too invested to stop and you know what it makes for good fodder on the podcast i'm not gonna front that's part of the reason why i'm going to continue going forward with the show but I also want to see how this plays out. Like how much more are they going to change? How much more is this silver timeline going to deviate from what we hold near and dear as people who love this franchise? I can see now why people hated season one because I am hating season two. And I think maybe... I got to take a a step back and think to myself, man, was I just fooling myself with season one? Was I just wrong? Because I was trying to be all, oh, hey, this is a different timeline. And this stuff is not meant for the casual, uh, for the hardcore. It's meant for casual people, people who are are sci-fi fans. I think I was lying to myself in season one because this shit is playing out in season two and it's it's taking it to another another level because again we've got spartans fighting without fucking armor we've got master chief running through the streets of reach without fucking armor if you're gonna put master chief in reach on reach where is the fucking armor Oh, God. Okay. I I just, I can't, I can't, I can't, um, I'm done. I'm done talking about this for this week. It's really, as you can see, I'm very, I'm very frustrated. I'm very passionate about what is not happening uh, right now in this show. So. To end on a somber note, because there's not going to be a brain dead comment of the week this week. I am skipping that this week because honestly, it's getting late. It's already 1015 and I need to work some magic on this and get this all ready for upload uh, next week. But so listen, I have been saying the past... I don't know, several weeks about how much the video game industry is changing. And it really, it really has been. And it's unfortunate about what's happening with so many people getting laid off. But the roosters are coming home to roost. The chickens are coming home to roost because of the sins that were uh, committed during the pandemic when money was free-flowing during that time and you had zero percent interest rates and a lot of these fucking companies and this is tech i mean this is all over the place tech and and video games and, and everybody it was going you know crazy hiring folks so We've seen over the past, we thought last year was bad. 
when it came to um and if you hear me clicking I'm trying to find the Bloomberg article Jason Schreier I think he was the first one to have an article uh somebody must have sent him the uh the heads up that these layoffs were um happening because he had stuff from the um the letter that was sent out by PlayStation announces today that they laid off 900 people. So it was basically 8% of their workforce uh, globally. That's still a lot. I mean, that is a lot of people. And it just kind of goes to show that even the king, well, Nintendo's really the king, but even the king, the so called king, Um, is not immune to what's going on right now. And here's, I'm just going to read the Bloomberg article here. Sony Group Corp will lay off 900 people across its video game division worldwide, or about 8% of its employees, and close a group in London. Quote, after careful consideration and many leadership discussions over several months, it has become clear changes need to be made to continue to grow the business and develop the company. Departing Sony Interactive Entertainment President and Chief Executive Officer Jim Ryan wrote Tuesday in a note to staff addressing the cuts. By the way, Jim Ryan's out the door and I wonder if a lot of this shit is on his head and it makes me think that he's being forced out here. You know, we knew he was going to be going People were like, oh, you know, what's happening here? Blah, blah, blah. Mm, mm, okay. Anyway, Sony said the layoffs will impact game makers Insomniac, the studio behind Spider-Man, Naughty Dog, which does The Last of Us, and Guerrilla Games Horizon, three of its most sub- successful subsidiaries. Guerrilla Games is cutting 10% of its staff, roughly 40 employees, according to people familiar with the matter. Sony's PlayStation's uh, Sony PlayStation London, best known for the SingStar series, as well as multiple virtual reality games, will shut down. Head of PlayStation Studios Herman Hull said in a note to staff Tuesday that the company has decided to cancel several games in development. Quote, sometimes great ideas don't become great games, he wrote. Sometimes a project is started with the best intentions before sh- before shifts within the market or industry results in a change of plan. By the way, Jim Ryan, who was all gung-ho about doing all these games as a service, yeah, there you go. There you fucking go. The PlayStation maker previously made huge investments in, here we go, games as a service or online games designed to be monetized over a long period of time. But the market for these games has become oversaturated and many have flopped. Sony recently canceled online games based on Spider-Man and The Last of Us. As part of the cuts, the company also canceled a service game based on the Twisted Metal Racing franchise which was in development at the UK-based subsidiary Fire Sprite, which was also impacted by the layoffs, according to a person familiar. Sony shares plunged earlier this month on the news that it was cutting projections for its PlayStation 5 console. In comments to shareholders, Sony Interactive Entertainment Chairman Hiroki Totoki, Literature Club, said that the company was looking to boost margins and improve its development efficiency. More than 6,000 video game industry workers have lost their jobs this year as budgets have skyrocketed and game companies have faced a post-pandemic spending slowdown and rising interest rates. This is why console war shit is stupid. You know why? Because when Microsoft did all these Xbox cuts last month, You had these PlayStation fanboys who were doing dancing in the streets, in the virtual streets of the internet, especially on Twitter. Oh, look at this. 
Mac Xbox buys Activision Blizzard, spends $75 billion on this acquisition, and then they go ahead and start laying people off. This is why you don't talk shit. <laughs> Seriously. Because here we are, what, a little over a month later, and the news breaks this morning that Sony, that PlayStation, that PlayStation is letting go of nine. Hundred employees, eight percent of their workforce, and the crazy thing is, it's affecting the big name studios, the ones that gave us Spider Man, the ones that gave us The Last of Us, the one that gives us my favorite franchise on the machine, and that's Horizon. It's crazy. It's it's really crazy. But I've been saying this for weeks now, how the industry is changing because games are getting too expensive. They're taking longer to make. It's more expensive to pay people now because you're borrowing money to pay people off of high interest rates. And then you're going months, years, almost a decade without publishing a new game. So if you don't have enough revenue coming in, how the fuck are you supposed to pay your bills? This is the stuff that I don't think like gamers think about. Either out of pure ignorance or they just generally just don't care about industry economics. And that's a bad thing because at the end of the day, it is going to affect what you play on these machines at the end of the day the industry right now is in turmoil i mean that people want to say oh it's not but it is it fucking is so there's going to be some kind of a sea change here i think going forward and maybe listen maybe this this is a blessing in the skies you know why because we have games like pal world and we have games like hell divers 2 And I'm not going to take complete credit for this thought because I saw somebody respond to the threads, but it makes a lot of sense. Those games have shown that you can be popular for cheaper. You can be popular at a $40 price range, a $40 to $50 price range, or even cheaper than that. It can be done. Now, there might be some negatives to that because we've seen how both those studios that have published Power World and Helldivers 2, they're going through some shit right now <laughs> because their games are so popular. We saw that happen with Power World last month and we're seeing that with Helldivers and Arrowhead this month. Like there, there are issues sometimes to being to being popular unexpected popularity sometimes can be a thorn in the side of a company but at the very least there it's going to be more than sustainable like hell divers right now is is they've had their issues with the server stuff but you know what they've they're starting to they're starting to recover pocket pair had all the success. I had to look up the developer because I totally forgot what the name is. Pocket Pair had all the success with, with Power World last month. And now things are getting that are getting better. So this is just it's just I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen. Are we gonna go back maybe to doing 15 to 20 hour games? I hope so. Because I only have a certain amount of time in the day, in the week, in the month, in the year to play games. And I try to play as much as possible, especially for the podcast. I'm in the, I am a little over halfway. I'll give you an example. I'm a little over halfway done with Final Fantasy 16. I love how PlayStation has the thing where it shows you how much of the main story you have done. I'm at 52%. And I'm about 22 hours. So you, you figure... Give or take, I'm going to put in 45 hours into this game. Because I am doing some of the side quests. So that's 45 hours. 
that's maybe double what I would want to spend on something like this. But I feel as though Final Fantasy 16 has been worth it. And you can see the care that they put into that game. But look, even Square Enix is having issues. Because if you only have one game, a game come out on just one platform, you kind of limit the amount of money you can make. And we're seeing that right now. Listen, listen, the crumbs were laid out last week when we had this stuff about PlayStation and this talk about games going to other platforms. We already saw Xbox do the same thing now, right? With Sea of Thieves and Hi-Fi Rush and Grounded and Pentiment now going to be available on PlayStation and Nintendo Switch. And there are probably going to be more games. Who knows if we're going to be seeing Starfield and others come to other uh, platforms. But it's 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 basically survive or die right now for these companies. So as much as these PlayStation fanboys don't like to hear it, it is very possible that you might see PlayStation games on Xbox at some point. It might happen. There's been this swell of support for putting Helldivers 2 on Xbox. Who knows? Helldivers 2 has done well on PC. PC is leading the charge over there. So why not get a games as a game as a service like Helldivers 2 on as many platforms as possible and that might mean bringing it to Xbox. Man, people's minds are going to explode on Twitter if that happens. But again, as I've been saying for weeks now, the industry is changing. You hate to see what's happening because there are only so many jobs available for these people that have been laid off. And I guess the blessing in disguise in some ways is to hope and pray that people who get laid off, that they start new studios. That they start new studios that focus on maybe more smaller and niche titles and you can make a name for yourself that way. If you have a studio that's starting with former Horizon devs, I'm, I'm in, man. Like, sign me the fuck up. Like, I'm all about that. I would be all about that. So I hope that these people find success. And I think that they, that they will. We've seen this time and time again in the industry where there are layoffs and people come back and they open up new studios and they make great, great games and they find success. I, I will have to say, it's interesting, the coincidence of reading this news today and the continuing saga that is the games industry right now in this current economic climate coincides with me reading Masters of Doom because even back then in the 90s there wasn't necessarily it was good economic times for these companies but there were instances of infighting of bad decisions being made of companies being too big in the case of Romero's company that he uh Iron Storm that he started after he got the boot from Id. So it's interesting to kind of see you know that listen that the games industry has had these sorts of issues for a long time as far as bad management is concerned and underperforming games. So by the way, I'm almost finished with that book and I should have a full report on it next week. So that is going to do it for episode 15 of the Nerd Federation podcast. Did things a little bit differently to start the show. I, I hope that hopefully that resonates with people when they click play on YouTube and start the video, quote unquote video, and you get a little introduction to what the episode is about. I'm on all the socials. Facebook, Twitter, uh, threads, 
Where else am I? Instagram, uh, TikTok. I'm all, I'm all over the place. So YouTube, YouTube uh, channel. And, you know, I'm thinking about doing... There are a lot of things that I'm thinking about. Hopefully, I get to doing some streaming soon enough. WWE 2K24 is coming out soon, and I would like to at least do some Let's Play videos. I don't know. I haven't played a wrestling game in so long, so I think it would be funny to kind of film myself playing and giving commentary as I go along and playing a wrestling game for the first time and and God knows how long. I think that could be... Uh, I think that could be entertaining. So, anyway, thanks for joining me. Really had a good time talking through these topics. I, I just, you know, I, I'm i passionate about this stuff. And I and I mentioned earlier how I, I can be down on not seeing the results that I want to see. But you know what? You push on. And if this turns out to be for not, then, hey, at least I can sit back and say, I gave it a try. Much like CM Punk's UFC career. (laughs) Damn. Anyway, on that note, have a great rest of your week, and I will see you soon. Thanks a lot.